Good afternoon. Thanks for joining us Across the Fence. I'm Fran Stoddard. Memorial Day is the traditional time in Vermont to plant your garden. If you're already started, but you've still got space for a few more plants and who doesn't have a little bit, consider pollinators. That's right, the birds and the bees and the bugs and the butterflies. Planting for pollinators is a small act that has a big impact on pollinator decline, especially when it comes to native bees, of which there are 350 species still buzzing in Vermont, according to the Vermont Center for Eco Studies. And these bees need our help. We met a woman in Charlotte who's leading a push protect pollinators by planting native and pollinator friendly plants to provide rest stops, so to speak, for these vital insects. Keith Silva caught up with this pollinator friendly promulgator at the wide spot in the road in Charlotte and filed this report. To call the intersection of Spear Street and Mount Philo Road in Charlotte, a wide spot in the road would be generous, but not inaccurate. That is, until Julie Parker Dickerson showed up and with apologies to Joni Mitchell, hauled manure and put up a paradise for pollinators. We're at the start of Charlotte. We are at a corner that typically just gets mowed. And while it is on private property, it is, um, it's, it's very much open to, the, to people. We're working with homeowners, first of all, who are so generous to give a part of their land. It does take coordination. So, you know, I talked to the town and we talked to the homeowners and we talked to all these wonderful people to coordinate a good day to do this. Um, so there's work involved in it, but it pays off in the end. You know what would be interesting? To plant this garden, Parker Dickerson did not have to break ground. Instead, she covered the grass with cardboard and then put compost and manure on top that was donated from local horse and dairy farms and planted directly into it. This no-till method makes it environmentally friendly while creating a home for insects. So using the no-dig method, the no-till method, we've made it so we're sequestering carbon. So that's another positive for the environment. It's one less space for us to mow, another good thing. And then we're also packing plants tightly in. So um, we have less weeding. So we're gonna be turning the soil a little bit less. When it comes to planting pollinator gardens, Parker Dickerson is a dynamo. This is the ninth pollinator garden she's helped establish and maintain in Charlotte. All of the plants for this project are either donated or Parker Dickerson has raised funds to buy them from local greenhouses and garden centers. All of the gardens connect to Pollinator Pathway Northeast, a grassroots effort focused on establishing pollinator-friendly habitat and food sources for butterflies and bees birds and insects. The purpose of this garden is to connect all of our home gardens to the gardens on the roadsides to make a path, a clear path for butterflies, bees. We know that they only travel a certain distance. We know a butterfly will travel a mile. A uh, bumblebee is only going to travel 250 uh, yards. So knowing this information, when we build places like these, we are making uh, a food, interconnecting the food web for them and for us. A pollinator garden Parker Dickerson put in less than a mile away is what brought Myra Handy out to lend her expertise to this project. Julie forced me. No. <laughs> I personally am uh, an avid gardener. I'm also on the board of the Lewis Creek Association, which is a watershed group covering the Lewis Creek and La Platte watersheds. It's been so, yeah, so wonderful coming out of the pandemic when everybody's been so isolated and depressed or whatever to have people being so enthused by something that pulls them together. Like Handy, like Kathy Hunter came out to volunteer too. She represents another local group of concerned citizens, Sustainable Charlotte. Sustainable Charlotte is an all-volunteer organization that tries to build community resilience in the face of climate change. Julie's done a great job of getting various volunteers to come in, whether it's to do some work, to contribute some plants, or to help finance this. Um, she's done an incredible job of getting us involved. Mm. So that seems really important to support. <laughs> and if you ask Julie if she wants plants, she always says yes. 
Ty Dinan lives nearby. What she likes about these pollinator gardens is that they attract more than birds and bees. And so what I've seen is that having the gardens, doing meetups to take care of the gardens, talking about the gardens is something that has created community connections. So that's my favorite part. And it also is beneficial on so many different levels in terms of wildlife and pollinators and, and just beauty. For Parker Dickerson, pollinator gardens are a way to demonstrate how one person or a small group of people can take on big problems like pollinator decline and climate change. Really, at the end of the day, what we need is more bees and butterflies and moths. When we do something like this, it inspires people to do something about climate change versus feeling sad about it. So I feel like the more pollinator gardens we put in and the more beauty people see, the less people are going to see the doom and gloom and get inspired to do something in their own way. So next time you're driving through Charlotte, follow the flight of the bumblebee, bird, and butterfly and visit a piece of paradise. In Charlotte, I'm Keith Silva with Across the Fence. Thank you, Keith, and thank you, Julie. We now turn from peace to war. From May 31st until June 12, 1864, fighting raged between the armies of the North and the South in northwestern Virginia during the Battle of Cold Harbor. Generals Lee and Grant were locked in a pitched battle that saw Georgia Vermont's own fighting farmer, General George Stannard, distinguish himself in what turned out to be a lopsided Confederate victory, one of the last that the South would achieve in America's Civil War. Let's join Vermont historian Howard Coffin as he describes the fighting and the feeling he and many other visitors get when they tour battlefields, where, as Howard says, something abides. In great deeds, something abides. On great fields, something stays. And reverent men and women from afar shall come to this desolate field to ponder and dream, and lo, the shadow of a mighty presence shall wrap them in its bosom, and the power of the vision pass into their souls. Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain on Battlefields. Here at Cold Harbor, one senses that something remarkable and mighty happened. It was one of the great battles of the Civil War that is now a quiet place of tall pine trees and bird song. I have never been here, and I suppose it's 20 times I've visited this place, that I haven't had the feeling of some kind of power. And I've never sent anyone to see Cold Harbor that didn't come away having felt a peculiar, powerful experience. On the morning of June 3rd, 1864, Ulysses Grant launched an attack on a six-mile front, sending his men against well-prepared Confederate entrenchments. The Union soldiers had been looking at those entrenchments for a couple of days, and they knew it was suicidal. Yet when the order was given to advance at first light on the 3rd of June, they moved out of their earthworks and started across this field, and they were immediately under a vicious fire, crossfire, musketry and artillery, and within about 15 minutes, 7,000 men had been shot down. The attack was a hopeless failure, the only mistake on a battlefield that Ulysses Grant ever admitted making. The Union soldiers fell back where they could and dug in, and the trench warfare that lasted more than a week went on in the heat of a Virginia summer. We're here between the lines where the wounded lay for days in the blazing sun. 
tries were made at night to bring some of them in and some succeeded, but the snipers on either side were picking off any effort like that. So the wounded lay here and suffered without food and water and slowly died. Finally, Lee and Grant came to a truce that was to last for an hour. The soldiers of both sides met out on this no man's land and brought in what living men there were left. And then the fighting went on. Behind me are one, two, three, four rows of earthworks, trenches here, and another one, and another one, and another one. I count seven rows of earthworks here where the Union soldiers dug in after the great attack at Cold Harbor, trying to stay alive. They lived for more than a week in these trenches, always under fire, always under the blazing sun. At Cold Harbor, the Confederates had been here days before the Union troops got here. And they had had time to prepare intricate defenses. Very few Union soldiers got near or into these Confederate works, but George Stannard's men did. He drove his soldiers over the earthworks, fought within the earthworks, but in the end was unable to hold his position and was forced to retreat back across this no man's land. It was a mighty try for Stannard here at Cold Harbor amidst one of the great slaughters of the Civil War. Our thanks to Howard and Across the Fence's Keith Silva for that story. And thank you for joining us Across the Fence. I'm Fran Stoddard. Stay well.